Okay, we are recording. Uh, I am Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College uh, in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined today by Darren Hudson-Hick, who is a philosopher at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina. Darren, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So we are talking about Taylor Swift. So this is part of a mini series, I guess, on Taylor Swift re-recording her back catalog and the philosophical implications uh, of her doing so. And so with you, I want to talk about copyright um, because, you know, that's one of the things you do in philosophy and maybe in real life. I don't know. Everybody wants to talk about copyright. Everyone wants to talk about copyright. Um, and so I think the place to start then is on ontology. Sure. Um, and so the ontology of, of music and of recorded music in particular, right? Because with with classical music, you have works which are notated in scores, which are then instanced in performances, which can then be recorded. But it's typically the, the performances, you know, these continuous things, uh, events are the instances of the works. Whereas with recorded music, um, we have, uh, you know, songs or, or recorded music in the rock or pop tradition, right? We have we have songs which can be instanced in performances, but can also be instanced in recordings. And those recordings are typically, you know, not recorded live performances, but it's sort of track by track that are stitched together, layered to get the, the final product that we have on, you know, the, the vinyl album or the CD or the MP3 or whatever. Um, and so let's talk about the ontology of, of pop music. Uh, so do you want to where do, do you want me to talk? Do you, you want to talk? I'll let you talk some, and then I'll talk some. How about that? Sure. So, yeah, let's start with um, the basics, and then we'll talk about how copyright complicates all of this. So, as you said, uh, with the basics uh, in the tradition of Western analytic philosophy, we uh, talk about classical music as our model and did for a long, long time. So the idea is you've got this thing that has been created, right? When you're talking about ontology, you're talking about an identifiable thing, right? What is the thing? And so we talk about the thing that has been created, the composition, for instance. And part of the reason it's convenient, although distracting, that analytic philosophy has started with uh, classical music is that there doesn't tend to be lyrics involved, which further complicates things. We just have a musical composition. There's other things we have to worry about, like um, instrumentation and so on, but it's pretty straightforward. We have a series of notes that have been put together by some composer, probably to be played on some instrument or range of instruments. And that's the thing. That's the identifiable thing that we can talk critically about and we can say that this is beautiful or that it is surprising or it has whatever aesthetic properties it has and then we have our second stage where we're going to perform this thing so we have a, a concert for instance we have a bunch of people who are up there who are attempting to sonically instantiate these notes as composed by this person so we can talk about the event as an object that's a thing we can also talk about a thing between those, which is the interpretive object. This, say, um, orchestra's interpretation of this composition. And that's a thing that we'll get to see embodied in various performances. So that might be a thing where um, the orchestra has made particular artistic choices. Right. When the when the composition says speed up here, play with feeling here, there's so many ways that we could interpret that. So this particular uh, orchestra will interpret that in some particular way. Fine. So we have like this three layers of ontology, three different objects. So we can compare any two of those. We could compare the original object and a performance of that object and ask how well they match up and whether this counts as a performance. We could compare two different interpretations of a performance, so two different uh, orchestras ways of uh, instantiating that, or two different performances on two different nights of the same interpretation. So there's potentially a lot of objects, but this tracks with how we think about um, practice when it comes to classical art and classical criticism. We'll also have recordings of these things, but normally 
um, unlike rock music, this is an attempt to capture a live performance. It might be an actual live performance in um, a venue, or it might just be that we got all of the orchestra together into some particular pace with the purposes of recording that. But it's going to be a performance in some particular place. It's weird to do much more than a little tweaking, right, of, uh, of the sound. Yeah, right. Like Glenn Gould got a lot of crap yeah. for editing his, his performances together. Yeah. Well, suck it. Glenn Gould's, Glenn Gould's awesome. Yeah. Exactly. Because, he, because he's Canadian. Yeah. So um, rock music tends to work differently. So you've got, you know, what you and I grew up with, which is a lot of garage rock, I imagine, where, yeah, so you have bands that do a lot of practicing and do a lot of uh, venue performance. Um, but we also have this other thing called the track, and Kanye's got that great paper about uh, making tracks. There's this object of critical interest. It's the thing that you're going to hear on the radio, which is where most of us are going to hear most of our rock music uh, or pop music. Most of what we hear is not going to be at live venues. We'll have those too, but we'll talk about that later. Um, mostly what you'll hear are MP3s or CDs or stream stuff from Spotify or just stuff on the radio. And that's the thing that was put together in a studio or on a computer or some combination of them. So the Rolling Stones will sit down. They're very old. They get to sit down and have and run through a song or parts of a song any number of times and pick the best pieces of that and then put that together. Or right, just to make it even more complicated, each performer will sit down and do their own part. And then we will merge these together on the computer to the most perfect version of this thing, the ideal version of the ideal performance, which is not a performance because it's not an event, but it's this thing, the track. And that's the thing that you'll get to hear delivered through Spotify or on YouTube or over the radio or whatever you like. And this, some arguments go, is the primary object of critical interpretation when it comes to rock and pop music. Whereas with classical music, it was the performance or it was the composition that is being performed. So the focus tends to shift depending on uh, what we're talking about. I think it's all pretty debatable so far as it goes. I think it depends whether you are a big fan of rock music. I'm not. Right. I mean, I, I listen to a lot of it. It's on the radio. It's ubiquitous. But I don't go to concerts and I don't go to concerts because they bug me. They bug me because what I hear in a concert is not what I hear in the track. Right. It's not what I wanted to hear. It's not what I expect. It's not what I know the perfect pacing of. It's not what I know every lyric to. When you go and see a live performance, they're going to change stuff up. They're going to improvise. The timing is going to be a little different, even if they're not screwing up. Right. Most of this is going to be intentional and the sound's not going to be perfect and people don't care because they're there to see their band to have this sort of broader experience and i don't give a damn about that this is just annoying to me i would much rather just be at home and listen to it on a speaker so um my central object of interest is the track that's what i care about others might lean towards that live performance that might be the central object of critical inquiry I guess it's just a focus issue. Yeah, right. I mean, some people will follow a band or an artist from, you know, uh, uh, town to town, city to city, you know, on a, a given tour and, you know, go to 10 concerts. And that's the thing they care about more than the recording. But yeah, I think for most listeners, yourself included, and I guess me included, because I don't go to that many concerts, it's, it's the thing on the radio, right? It, it's the track that's of interest. And so how then does this hook on to issues of copyright and issues of ownership. Okay, so just to further complicate things, we have several objects already on the table, right? Uh, in the classical music, you've got the composition, you've got sort of a, a performative interpretation of that composition, and then you have individual performance events. Over the land of rock music, you have the track, which is a thing, the thing that we are critically evaluating that is put together by performers and producers, but it's not itself a performance in most cases. And then you've got individual live performances, which are not unlike what you would get with classical music. These are objects, and copyright has objects. In copyright, the objects are the things that are owned. So they're what I call authored works. Um, 
They are the things that are protected by copyright, the things that you have legal entitlement to. And so the track is going to be one of those things. Uh, in order to merit copyright in America, uh, a thing has to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. It has to be, well, in this case, recorded, right? Um, if, if a song is only ever performed live, uh, so an improvised piece of jazz or something like that, there is no copyright to that thing. It's only copyrighted once it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And that could be anything, right? It could be magnetic tape. It could be um, a, a phono record, uh, the, a vinyl record. It could be a uh, just an MP3 file. All of these qualify. So that fixing is important for copyright. And that track will be a thing. It has qualities. It is a copyable thing. That's the thing about tracks. We copy them. Right. We copy them either by copying them computer to computer. You email me an MP3. We've copied that thing or we copy it uh, by playing it. Right. So playing something on YouTube is making a copy of it. You are instantiating that. OK, so there's that thing. But then there are two other things that are also copyrightable things and they are embodied in that track. One is well, in the case of pop and rock music, unlike classical, lyrics. So what you might think of as just on its own, a kind of poetry, right? It's these words in that order. If somebody puts words in order just as a piece of poetry, that's a copyrightable thing. That's an object, that's an authored work, and you get rights to that thing. There's the other thing, which is the musical composition, which in the case of pop music and rock music is usually pretty intertwined with the lyrical stuff, but can come apart. So it's not unheard of to have a piece of instrumental music that somebody then writes lyrics to. Well, these are two different things. One is composed of sounds or instrumented sounds in a particular arrangement. The other is composed of words. Okay, so you've got the words. That's a copyrightable thing. You've got the musical composition. That's a copyrightable thing. And then you've got the recording of that as a track. That's a copyrightable thing. They're all independently, in principle, copyrightable of each other. So you write, um, you write some, some music. Good. You get a copyright to that thing. You send that to me and say, I need some lyrics, poet that I am. So I write something about copyright uh, as lyrics to your song. All right. I've got a copyright in that thing. We have two distinct copyrights. And then we get together with our garage bands, which we need to come up with a name for. Uh, and we make a recording of that thing. Boom. Third copyright. All those copyrights might be owned by one person, right? If one person did all of that stuff, or they might be owned by disparate people, depending on how that goes. And to lean into uh, Taylor Swift, which is where we're going, you can sell any one of those independently of the other. And so each of these is an object so far as copyright's concerned. It's a thing that has properties, particularly the property of being owned and having been created. So in the land of ontology, they're different objects. They just get to be complicated because you got that fourth object, which is the combination of the music and uh, the lyrics having not yet been recorded, but is nevertheless a sort of amalgam of two other things. Ontology quickly gets pretty complicated once we're talking about merging objects and how they're instantiated in each other. I mean, it's not that weird, right? We get um, Lewis Carroll would have poems that he wrote that also show up in larger works, right? You've got one work making up a larger work, or you have movies in a series, right? Smaller things making up a larger thing. It's the same sort of idea. It's just that it happens to be grounded in legal practice as well as artistic practice. So Taylor Swift writes a song. I don't know if Taylor Swift writes her songs, but I get the impression that she does. She does, yeah. Good. And I get the impression that she does both the lyric and the instrumentation. Yeah, she, right. she, um, she writes or co-writes almost all of her songs. Good. Okay, and it's not unusual to co-write one or other part of this yeah. in pop music. This is normal. Okay, and in such a case, without an agreement otherwise, the people who co-write the thing have co-ownership over it. They both have complete but shared ownership. So if you and I co-wrote a song, 
you and I both get copyright to that thing. So if somebody wants to make a copy of that legally, they can ask you and you can give them permission or they can ask me and I can give them permission. They don't have to get permission from both of us. We both have complete copyright in that thing that we share it. So normally the way that the, uh, the music industry works is the way uh, it's similar to the way that publishing uh, books works. You make an arrangement with the publisher that they get certain rights and you retain certain rights. So about half the stuff that I publish as books, I've sold the copyright to that thing in exchange for uh, the, the big money that rolls in with revenue, right? Um, my, my little royalties. Other times I get to keep the copyright, but the publisher gets an exclusive uh, uh, license to publish that thing, which is effectively the same as giving away the copyright. It works out the same way. But in music, often what happens is the person who has created all of this stuff keeps the copyright to the song and the music, but gives away the copyright to the track, to the music publisher, who will then get to decide what happens to that thing. They get complete control of it. And there will be some payment of royalties uh, back to the copyright or based on sales. The copyright owner of the song also gets royalties based on being the writer when it's played on the radio, but that's a separate thing. Yeah, yeah, right. It's, it's so with, with most recording artists, it is precisely that, that, you know, as you said, that they give over copyright to the recordings, to the tracks, to, uh, you know, whatever record company they've signed with. Right. And that's, yeah, this is just normal in all forms of publishing, right? The, yeah. What the publisher does is they are able to give your work an audience, right? Uh, the, the publisher acts as a sort of filter. And so they're able to get the stuff out there and they decide what's worth putting out there. And they're going to put the money behind it because there's going to be money that's required to put behind it. So when you sign a contract with uh, Oxford or Bloomsbury, or whoever, um, you were saying, I'm willing to give all this stuff away because I couldn't get the audience that you have access to, or I couldn't make the money, or I don't want to go through the business of dealing with the money. I just want to make my stuff and be able to sit back and do that. Right. So the earlier you are in your career, the more you have to give away because the less cachet you have to go to somebody else and say, no, I can get a better deal over with this publisher and I'll go to them. Um, you know, when you are huge, you get to make demands. When you're yeah. new, you got to take whatever scraps are thrown to you. Yeah. 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 Right. And, and so, yeah, when, when Taylor Swift first signs with Big Machine Records back in early, I guess, middle of like 2005 or whatever 2006 uh yeah yeah she she gives over um licensing to the masters the copyright to the master recordings of her albums to the record label uh and then they make the majority of money off of those sales and with with most artists right they're not going to sell much the company's not going to make much they're going to make way less but in her case she you know, grew and grew and grew and, you know, sale, 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 sale. And so it, it's a huge chunk of money that's being made, most of which is going to the company, very little of which is going to, to her relatively. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, when she, uh, uh, you know, jumped ship to Universal Music um, in 2018 or whatever, uh, one of the stipulations of the new contract was she has ownership of the masters, right? Um, and, and so, uh, you know, what, what happens is, um, you know, as you know, and as a lot of people watching this would know is her previous record label gets sold to, uh, Ithaca Holdings Company, which is owned by Scooter Braun, who's a, uh, music, uh, record manager of recording artists. So he is Justin Bieber's manager, uh, and famously, infamously Kanye West's, uh, manager, right? And so he buys the Taylor Swift's former record label, which means he now has the legal right to her master recordings. And thus he could do whatever he wants with them, right? He can license them to TV shows, to movies, to advertising campaigns. And there's nothing that Taylor Swift can do about it. He can take them out of print. He can refuse to license them. Yeah, complete control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, 
how should we think of you know what's happening with with her re-recordings then right so she's she's gone on to re-record her original six albums that she recorded under her previous record label um and her goal largely is to duplicate them right so they sound just like the originals so that they can substitute for the originals when it comes to licensing for tv for movies for advertising campaigns and so forth right that most likely what she do is underbid uh whoever owns the the original recordings now right that that you know they are trying to license it for three hundred thousand. i'm going to license it for two hundred thousand. And all of that money is now going to me as opposed to 15% of, of the larger sum, which ends up being smaller for her. Um, so what do you think of that, that sort of thing, right? It, it, it's legally allowed for an artist after a period of time to re-record their music, uh, to make sonic duplicates, I guess, of the originals as a way to sort of sub in for the originals in these sorts of contexts. So what do you think of, of cases of, of this sort? I think it's a weird case. It's uh, and it's hard. So part of what's hard about it is going to depend on the details of Taylor Swift's original arrangement with Big Machine, right? Um, copyright is actually a bundle of rights. Uh, you get a bunch of different rights with this. One of these is the right to make exclusive copies, right? Um, the, the right of reproduction. The other is the right to make derivative works. So a derivative work is a, uh, a, a recasting or a transformation or adaptation of a thing that you own. So like an easy case is a, making a movie adaptation of a, of a novel um, or making an annotated version of a book or something like that. These are all derivative works and it's hard not to think about a recording as a derivative work right it, it depends on the original in a very strong way uh where the original in this case is the song right either just the lyrics or just the music or the combination of those things so she owns all of that stuff what she doesn't own is the copyright to the track of the original that's owned by uh, scooter braun so she has the exclusive right to make derivative works based on what she does own, which is the song. And so to make a recording of that thing, to make a phono record of that. What I find risky for copyright, and I am not a copyright lawyer, and this does not count as legal advice, um, is when she is trying as hard as she can to make a perfect duplicate of the master recording, the original uh, track, is she copying that thing? So for me, this is both a sort of uh, ethical, legal, and ontological question. Um, are they the same object? I think in the world of audio recordings, I want to say no, right? For it to be uh, a token of the type to be uh, a, an actual instance of the recording. It has to be an actual copy of it, right? Made through mechanical means. And copyright law has a lot to say about mechanical uh, duplicates. Um, she's not doing that, right? She's, she's simply trying to replicate it sonically. She has ownership over these objects. This is a new object that is based on that. It embodies it. And I, I, I know from what you've written that there are little differences between the re-recordings and the original. I mean, my inclination as an ontologist is to say that these are different objects, right? There are, there are different types which have different tokens, which both embody the same song Right in this um, in this very thin sense of uh, of embodiment, they've both got the same song in them embodied. Um, they're just very very similar. Here's a question about the ontology of copying: When does something qualify as a copy of a thing? 
when does that thing qualify as a token of the type? And when is it a completely distinct object? Right, if, um, if you and I both write haikus, right? Like high school English class. And by coincidence of all the millions of English speakers writing haikus in English, we happen to string together the same 17 syllables in the same order. We have created word for word indistinguishable poems. Under copyright, these are distinct works. They look exactly the same, they sound exactly the same, but they are different objects. So in the wonderful world of copyright, you get copyright to yours and I get copyright to mine, and they are sonically indistinguishable, um, linguistically indistinguishable objects. They might have very different meaning, but copyright doesn't care about meaning, right? Copyright is purely formal. So if somebody wants to print your poem in their book, but you ask way too much money, they can just come and ask me to print my poem in their book. and Moreover, because this isn't Europe, which has slightly different rules, they can put your name on it and it would be fine, right? They can get away with that. And I can just make a living at undercutting your grand uh, haiku with my crappy little haiku that just happens to look the same. So they would be distinct objects under copyright law because they're each created by different things. Um, in this case, it's easy because neither of us copied the other, right? We just independently uh, by fiat wrote these things. So we can model the Taylor Swift case on this and say, well, look, these are two distinct objects. Taylor Swift uh, made one of these objects for Big Machine and she made the other object for herself at some point. And they happen to sound the same, but they are not the same. They are both derived from different processes. They both embody the same, you know, uh, the same song. Uh, to, to speak loosely, um, but they are distinct things. So yeah, if they want, you know, if some uh, TV producer wants to use Taylor Swift's song, they don't have to go to Big Machine. They can go directly to Taylor Swift and get it at a discount and also, you know, not have to pay Scooter Braun for this. So that's win-win, right? Very nice. But my little thing that eats at me is this isn't a clean case like the haikus, right? She's copying the original master. She's attempting to make something that sounds just like that. That's not so clean anymore. I don't know of a case that's gone through in copyright that's actually had to test this. Um, so Taylor Swift might be playing with fire. I don't know yeah, about I mean, sonic duplicates. There are other examples, right? So Def Leppard re-recorded three of their hits from the 80s back mm -hmm. in like 2012, 2013. Uh, and I mean, in that case, the duplication is damn near perfect. Um, like, Did they get sued it, for it? I don't think so, because yeah. I think artists are allowed, like there's a particular window of time where they can re-record their pieces however they like and own the masters to those, right? There's some, usually it's, I think typically it's like two years or something, right? That you so, can re-record within two years and the, the sonic similarities or differences are irrelevant. So we can build that into a contract, right? That's yeah. easy. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a... There's another route that in principle you could make, which is just that you're making a, a cover track of your own song, right? And built into copyright law are a lot of rules about uh, cover tracks, what are called mechanical licenses, right? I, If I want to record a version of um, a song that you've made famous, I can do that. I don't need permission. I just need to pay a set licensing fee for that to, well, the original songwriter which in this case would be Taylor Swift herself. So in principle, she could always go that route. Uh, if there's something built into her contract about re-recordings, then she's just covered. But if there isn't, then we've got an interesting question of whether this counts as a copy or not. It's when you have all these objects floating around in uh, the ontological atmosphere, things start to get pretty difficult about what counts as a copy and what's an independent thing. Um, Ontology has all these great questions that it has not yet attempted to answer about how objects combine together um, and how they merge together. And we sort of, uh, we, we, we tend to dabble with these things and then just back away slowly. Um, like different versions. I just don't know how to deal with versions uh, when it comes to ontology. 
we can go with a simple model of it's an embodiment of another abstract object, but can one abstract object embody another abstract object? In principle, okay, I'm okay with this. I'm onologically promiscuous. I'll allow for as many objects as it takes to get the job done. Um, but when we build the law into it, we add an area of complication, right? Because we talk about legal ownership to a thing and what that entails. So she has legal ownership to the songs, which means she has the sole legal right to make derivative works of that, which would be, you know, recordings. Um, is it a copy? This is the thing that bugs me as a philosopher. It's a duplicate. They're indistinguishable, or at least that's what she's aiming for, but it has gone through an entirely different causal pathway. In fact, a parallel causal pathway. So I think I would have to look at it counterfactually, right? And say, had the original master recording been different, would the re-recording be different? I think it would be. It, it seems like she's not trying to produce simply a cover of her earlier stuff. She's trying to produce simply through independent means another token of the same type. If she gets too close to succeeding, it just becomes an instance of the thing that Big Machine owns. I mean, probably not legally because legality does care about that causal process. But in other cases, it just doesn't. In other cases, like mostly when people get sued for copyright infringement, they don't admit to having copied anything. And so we have to go through this process of determining whether or not a copy was made. And it's a two-step process. We first ask, does the person who's making the purported copy have access to the original, right? Would they have known about the original? Because if nobody knew about the poem that you wrote when you were a teenager and hid away in your drawer because you were ashamed of your angsty teenage poetry, then I mean, there's no reasonable claim to having copied it. There has to be a causal relationship there. And then we have to ask, is it sufficiently similar? Is it substantially similar is the test for the law to the original? So not only did you have access, did you make a thing that sounds in this case a lot like that? And that's exactly what Taylor Swift is aiming for. Something that sounds exactly like the original, but of course she had access to, she made it. So without knowing details about rights to re-record, um, we have a, a, an, an open question about rights, but my question is always more onological anyway. So is it the same thing or a token of the same type? And I, I got to say, it's getting close. Yeah, yeah. And I think that most artists in their contracts have rights to re-record. I think it's like a typical like two, three year period. Uh, you know, after you record the original, you sort of have the right to re-record it. And I think that one thing that's happened in the wake of Taylor Swift sort of announcing the re-recordings and then beginning to release them is that record labels have started to change the period of time uh, in new contracts to, you know, when an artist can re-record, you know, from like two years to five years or 10 years, whatever, to try to avoid this sort of thing happening in the future, which hurts them, right, financially, because now more, all the money is going to the artist rather than to us, the label. Right. And this is, I mean, where the democratization of publishing has changed things, right? Um, in... 2005, you say she, she first uh, signed on with Big Machine, somewhere around there? You're on mute. Yeah, her first, thank you. Her, her first comes out at, at like 2006 or seven. So yeah, okay. it would have been around 2005. So at this point, the music industry is still sort of figuring out how to do digital delivery of stuff, right? S streaming isn't really a thing yet. Um, you have like iTunes, um, but you're also dealing with the problems of like Napster and things like that uh, of, of, of illicit sales or illicit copying. Um, 
but now streaming as is a game changer when it comes to delivery it's actually a way for the owner of the song to viably make income on it right uh there was a danger before that as soon as you've got digital files and stuff just gets shared for free nobody's going to buy them anymore because why would you because people are bastards so now there's a viable model and people are perfectly happy to stream stuff on you know youtube or uh, spotify or whatever they don't need to go making copies and put it on their com computer. It's now less labor intensive to get it legally. So now we have a, a viable model uh, and independent artists can get their stuff on Spotify, right? Or put their own stuff up on YouTube. There's still a promotion issue. You still need to meet, make people aware of it, but that's not Taylor Swift's problem anymore. Um, people are buying her stuff because of her name. They don't neutrally they don't give a damn about who owns the master and if they do give a damn they're going to go where taylor swift has gone for moral reasons um but yeah the landscape is absolutely changing so as soon as somebody has made a name for themselves if their contracts allow them to do a uh, re-recording then absolutely they're all going to go taylor swift's way um and i think that's precisely what the record companies are afraid of now which is why they're <laughs> because I think other artists have announced they're going to start re-recording. I mean, again, some artists have already done that. Um, the new wave band Squeeze did it. Def Leppard did it. Um, Jeff Lynne from ELO recorded, re-recorded ELO's greatest hits, although he did it with the express aim of improving on the originals. And there are, they are very different um, than the originals. But yeah, so Swift is like the biggest name person to do it. And now other artists are like, why don't we do it too? Like we could do what Swift is doing. And so, yeah, yeah. And this comes back to the whole question of what takes onological priority in a musical tradition, right? With classical music, it was the live performance. But the arguments from, uh, I think, Kanye and others are that the track takes onological priority or at least critical priority uh which means that's the central object of interpretation so you'll get the groupies who will go to all the concerts you get the deadheads and and that's fine right the the concert ticket collectors but most of us like you and me are just happy to listen to the track that's the thing against which we're judging live performances right we're saying this is or is not close enough to the track to make me happy um, and that's exactly what Taylor Swift is trying to do is create something that's close enough to the track to make people happy, as opposed to improving on it, right? I'm sure at this point, she's come far enough in her musical development that she could make what she thinks is a better track. But that's not her interest, right? She wants to create something that is a market substitute for the original, and presumably not for artistic reasons, right? But for like reasons of integrity, something like this. Yeah, integrity, independence, and so forth. Um, and money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's that's high up on the list. Uh, Darren, thanks so much for joining me. This is a really fun talk. I, I was thrilled to do it, uh, and now you've got me listening to Taylor Swift. Good. <laughs> awesome. Thank you.